get yourself a brew and get yourself comfy on the sofa because you don't want to miss this video. It's five things you don't know about Oosburn, part two. It's coming up. Hello, my name's Eddie. Welcome to my channel, Tyneside Life. And if you haven't been here before, I cover the history and culture and football of Newcastle and the general Tyneside area. So if any of that appeals to you, make sure you hit the subscribe button so every time I release a new video, you'll receive a notification. So without any further ado, let's dive into it. So number one, did you know that Oosburn had a tunnel called the Queen Victoria Tunnel? And if you did, do you know much about it? Well, yesterday I went on the two hour tour. It cost uh, 15 pound, you get a free guidebook and it was absolutely brilliant. They do two tours. The other one I think is about an hour and a quarter, costs 12 pound. Either one, I would highly recommend it. So why was it built? Well, first we're gonna to have to go back to 1835 and that was the height of the Industrial Revolution. And in 1835, they opened up a coal pit at Spittal Tongues, which is about a mile northwest of St. James's Park. And the coal that they got from there, they brought down to the River Tyne to be put onto boats via a horse and cart, which went through the cobbled streets of Newcastle. But that was, it was expensive because of various road taxes, but also it was very noisy. There was lots of coal dust, and uh, horse manure. So the local residents who were well to do at that time were making lots of complaints. So after three years of this, there was a big meeting and they decided to dig a tunnel. And it took two years and two months for 200 men to dig out this tunnel with spades and with spikes on the bottom of their boots to dig out the clay. At its deepest, it was about 85 feet down. And the map that you're looking at now is, uh, don't take it as an absolute representation of the the path of the tunnel but you'll just get a general idea of its approximate route from Spittle Tongues down to Oosburn. So now they had a coal wagon way and they would put the coal into huge uh, coal wagons and on tracks because it was a slight gradient from Spittle Tongues down to Oosburn it could travel down on its own momentum uh, through gravity and at speeds of 30 mile an hour it would take about six minutes to get to the river. It would take four minutes to offload the coal on the stairs onto the ship and 10 minutes to pull it up by rope via a stationary steam engine back at Spittle Tongues. So the whole process took 20 minutes, staggering. So the tunnel being used as a coal wagonway only lasted for about 18 years till 1860 when the coal mine closed down for one reason or another. It was then just left and abandoned for about 60 years when World War II kicked off in 1939, where they decided to adapt the tunnel as an air raid shelter. In order to do that, they concreted the floor and built seven more entry and exit points along its route. But also they built uh, blast walls, which were about a foot thick in a tiny little chicane to prevent any bomb debris going shooting down the tunnel. And they'd be down there for about eight hours because the German Luftwaffe would pass over Newcastle onto other destinations, go on their bombing raids and come back via the city and drop off whatever bombs they had left. So they were in there for about eight hours in those dark, in damp conditions and it was uh, regarded as one of the worst bomb shelters in Britain at the time because of its really small claustrophobic space and because of the damp conditions and poor air quality. At various points on the wall you'll see yellow paint, well that's mustard gas detection paint and what it was designed for is that if mustard gas got into the tunnel it would turn salmon pink. And after the Second World War, it basically sat there doing nothing. I think it was closed in about 1960, but reopened in 1976 when the local water board decided to use a large section of the tunnel for sewerage pipes rather than digging new tunnels. So there's only about 700 metres of the tunnel now, which can be used for the tours, which started in 2010 by the, the Oosburn Trust, who now manage the, uh, that section of the tunnel and the tours. Number two, Oosburn doesn't have one tunnel, it's got two tunnels. The second one's called the Oosburn Culvert. And you may be wondering what a, a culvert is. Well, basically it's some sort of structure, usually concrete that goes over a stream or a river to help control its direction and channel or to give it some sort of protection or to build over the top of it. And why did it need one? Well, pre-1900ish, um, the Oosburn Valley had two bridges. One was a, a railway line, the other one was the main biker bridge, which had horses and carriages. But it, behind me, it created logistical difficulties for people to get from the east of the city into the city centre because it was like a, like a 30 foot ravine. So they wanted to build a culvert and then fill over the top of it over the decades so that they'd build houses and roads. 
So between 1907 and 1911, they actually they built this culvert with a plan being for about uh, 40 years, they were gonna hook up that with industrial waste, household rubbish, dust and other bits and bobs will just collate over the top of it till it got to such a height where they could start building houses and other roads on the top of it. But when they got to that period, the 40s and the 50s, uh, they noticed that it just wasn't high enough and wasn't strong enough to support those sort of structures. When World War II kicked off in 1939, they decided to convert this culvert into an air raid shelter, so they had two in Usburn. So they built a sort of an airframe inside with a concrete base over the uh, river so that um, people could use it as an air raid shelter. And whereas the Victoria Tunnel was seen as one of the worst in Britain, this was seen as one of the best. And actually during those 40, 50 years in the early 1900s, people from the local area, especially kids, would go uh, ratching for stuff that they could use or find. It was called Scratton on the pit. You can just imagine at the time, well, I imagine that it was just like one giant fly tip in sight for 40 or 50 years. Eventually, the councillor Thomas Dan Smith came on the scene in the 1960s and uh, realised that it just wasn't going to happen with these houses and roads. So he decided to commission the building of the uh, City Stadium Park. So where I'm stood right now is the Culvert Memorial Bandstand and that con concrete structure behind me, that's the old entrance to the Culvert. But you can see from this angle, behind the entrance to the Culvert, uh, the bank, I mean, uh, back in the uh, early 1900s, that bank wasn't there, it just didn't exist. That's all part of that landfill process over the decades. So behind me there, that's the uh, semi-built City Stadium Park and the culvert runs underneath there, probably 20 to 30 feet down. Number three, that's the Oosburn Clooney chimney directly behind me, and it used to be twice the height of what it is now. It was taller than the Baker Bridge, but I'll come back to that in a second. It was built in 1848 as part of the steam-powered flax mill at Clooney House, just a few feet away. Eventually, the chimney was decommissioned at around 1900, and they built a, a blacksmith's on the base of it, and you can see the entrance door just on the side there. But in 1939, at the start of the Second World War, they didn't want to give the German Luftwaffe any advantages at all, because the chimney just dominated the skyline. It was all you could see for miles and miles, and they didn't want to use it as a, a wear marker when going on bombing raids in other parts of the UK. So in 1939, they knocked half of it down. Basically, a guy stood on the top, shuffling backwards with a mallet, knocking all the bricks in, which are still there today. Number four, for me, one of the most fascinating and interesting buildings in Usburn is the Clooney building just over my right shoulder there. Currently a thriving centre for music, art and socialising. But it wasn't always like that, especially with its industrial revolution beginnings back in the uh, mid-1800s. So in 1848, it was built as a steam-powered flax mill. It was like this for many years. At some point in its history, it became a bonded warehouse and bottling plant for Clooney whiskey. Gradually over the decades, the industrial revolution declined and by the mid-1900s, Oosburn generally was being emptied and the building was just left with uh, nothing in it at all. So in 1983, a guy called Mike Mould, who had a theatre production company called The Brothers, double V, he bought it for about £50,000 and wanted to start using it and create it into a kind of a fun palace. And now it has 40 artist studios, it's got a small theatre, it's got a, a music venue that can hold up to 300 people and a bar. So today, it's a really thriving place to come and socialise and they do lovely food. So Mike Mould and his son Angus actually lived right on the top floor because they built some flats at the very top. Unfortunately, Mike Mould passed away in 2020. And last, but certainly no means least, number five, it's the Oosburn Community Farm. And most people think of the farm as just a farm with animals and a bit of a cafe, but it's a lot more than that. And it has a really interesting history. Like other properties here, it has its beginnings in the Industrial Revolution going back to 1871. The Northumbrian lead works purchased the land and they used it to, with a steam engine to power grinders. They would grind uh, white lead into powder to be used for varnish and paint and that went on for decades. But like most other places in Oosburn through the decline of the Industrial Revolution going into the mid 1900s, everything was left and it wasn't until about 1976, a group of parents from Baker purchased the land and they wanted to develop a farm uh, basically for their children who could have access to animals and learn how to grow food 
I had a desire to bring a bit of nature and farm life to an otherwise completely urban area. I felt that their children having access to tending to animals and grow their own food would, would help them gain a stronger sense of their, their, the wider perspective of their place in the world, but also to be more individually grounded. And over the decades, the farm's just gone from strength to strength and now it's its own charity and it has community-based projects for adults with learning disabilities and other complex difficulties and with autism spectrum disorder. So the projects that now run for these adults are for gardening, kitchen, animal and creative projects. It helps them build some self-esteem, some confidence, but a sense of um, empathy and compassion, responsibility and respect. So the charity really is doing some amazing work with these individuals and you can get involved yourself as an individual or with your company, you can make donations to the charity or you can get personally involved as a volunteer. For organisations and companies, you can hire the whole farm for corporate days. So come along, whether it's to be involved as some sort of volunteer or just as a visitor with your family. We've got a lovely cafe in there. You can come and see the animals. Unfortunately, it's closed at the moment because I've had an outbreak of avian flu. So I hope you've learned something there. This isn't just a farm with a cafe. This, for me, is a place of inspiration and somewhere we should be proud of. So that's it for another video. I hope you've enjoyed it and perhaps even learned something. If you liked it, give us a thumbs up. Don't, leave, don't forget to leave us any comments below if you have something to add on what I've said. But also, don't forget to subscribe. Until next time, catch you later.